Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group meeting for December 21st, 2022. Happy Solstice Day, everybody. Uh, this meeting is recorded and will be shared on YouTube. So please make sure that you are complying with the antitrust policy by the Linux Foundation. You can find that here on this link in the show note or in the agenda notes, which you can find publicly available as well. So uh, before getting started, there's a few people on the call. I just want to give them a second to see if there's any community announcements. If not, I'll just get started with the remainder of the agenda. Hello, everyone. Pete Harris. Um, haven't been on this call for a while, but uh, I will be uh, probably more in the future as I'm kind of getting back into the healthcare space involving uh, AI and blockchain. So looking awesome. forward again. Thanks, Pete. All right, so we could first, I wanted to start off by saying, you know, first of all, thanks for joining and and thanks for taking time to listen in. What we typically do here is we go through some upcoming events that might be going on in the blockchain healthcare technology space, as well as go over some industry news and articles related to the industry and some additional educational nuggets that we've we found over the last couple of weeks. Uh, there's a lot of events going on next year. I'm not going to go ahead and click on each of them, but as you can see here, you have the Digital Health Summit, um, which is going to be at the Consumer Electronic uh, Show or Trade Show. So this is CES, a very big show. Um, so if you're attending, take a look at the Digital Health Summit that's happening there. The Innovator MD Global Summit 2023, that's happening January 11th to the 13th. The World Crypto Conference in Zurich is happening January 13th through the 15th. DSI London, which is going to be an interesting event uh, in London, actually, where people from the decentralized science community are going to come and speak about you know, what's happening and updates in that space as well. And there's also a hackathon a couple of days before that on the 13th and 14th, I believe. So check out their website if you're interested. And excuse me if I cough. I'm going to, I had a recently getting over a flu. So uh, February 15th through the 17th, the European Blockchain Convention is happening in Barcelona. That'll be a big event as well. Paris Blockchain Week will be March 20th through the 24th. Vive, which is a relatively newer healthcare conference is happening March 26th to the 29th as well. I think it's like, I don't know what year they're on, but um, should be an exciting time as well. Lots of great speakers. So Oracle Health, et cetera. Uh, HIMS, classic healthcare conference for IT technology, healthcare management stuff. Uh, that's happening in Chicago, April 17th, 2023 as well. Consensus 2023, a major blockchain event hosted by Coindesk is happening in Austin next year in April. And then Bitcoin 2023, it's a famous conference for Bitcoiners in Miami, happening May 18th to the 20th. And then there's later in the year, September 2023, the Con V2X Global Blockchain and Healthcare 2023 happening in New Orleans as well. So... Check out the links to the sites. If you have any questions, leave them in the YouTube or um, reach out to the organizers. Happy to help make any connections if you're interested as well. So uh, before we are now, you know, without any further ado, let's dive into some recent uh, you know, happenings here in the industry. So two things from Hyperledger I wanted to share with everybody, just so that you're all aware, this is a Hyperledger meeting. So Hyperledger So Long was released and it's a new, um, an update to an existing application here with the Berlin release Hyperledger So Long substantially improved its capability with many existing Ethereum dApps and concepts within the Polkadot and Kusama ecosystem. So porting from Ethereum to a substrate parachain is now easier since the complier supports almost all language constructs as Ethereum Solidity 
Uh, this release represents just the beginning of a series of upcoming achievements yet to unlock for the substrate co compilation target. So some more information in here if you're a developer. Um, definitely check this out if, if you're interested. Congrats to that team for this release. That's that's an interesting development, sort yeah. of embracing the uh, polka dot world. Yeah, definitely. And the Kusama ecosystem too. Yeah, which is kind of all part of that. Interesting. Had no clue that was going to be happening. Yeah. The other Hyperledger announcement I wanted to share was that there are five new members who have joined the consortium or the foundation, really. And they are um, Energy Web, the European Blockchain Association, Howist, Instant, Integra Ledger. Uh, yeah, those are the five right there. And they go into detail about who they are. Um, so it's been interesting to see you know, the number of members of this foundation continue to grow. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in learning more about that, and if you're interested in becoming a member as well, um, you know, either you can reach out to me or you can find more information on the website as well. I did find one other thing interesting in this article. Hyperledger Foundation continued to add to its project landscape with the introduction of Hyperledger Anon Creds, a widely used verifiable credential format. So, you know, I've heard and on creds before, so it should be interesting to see how, you know, that collaboration um, will unfold. And just to give you some numbers here, in 2022, Hyperledger's total code contributor community grew more than 18% with an average of almost 800 individuals actively contributing in each month. Pretty significant for this still nascent industry. All right. Um, excuse me. So uh, lots of things have happened since our last meeting, uh, which was about a month ago. The future of NLP in healthcare. So I'm sure many of you have heard of OpenAI's chat GPT AI system. Basically, it's a, na a natural language processing tool and sort of like a chat bot, but that's much more effective and has a lot more capabilities. Um, and you sound like you're talking to, you know, maybe a high school student <laughs> uh, or even an undergrad to some degree for some questions. So this article here, uh, published December 10th by Jared Dashevsky, basically talks about how this can be used in healthcare and talks about the many different applications um, that has potential. So, you know, here he's asking the chat GPT how healthcare will, or how we will ever fix this broken healthcare system. And uh, you can see the chat GPT saying, it's difficult to predict the future, but I believe that with the right efforts, it is possible to improve the healthcare system and make it more effective and accessible for everyone. Great. <laughs> um, that's great. So some specific examples that are mentioned here. One is patient care and delivery, delivery, research, diagnostics, and treatment, uh, clinical and non-clinical workflows. So, and then it goes into more details about how that's possible, how they could do that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this tool is really interesting. Open chat. I think the fact that they made this publicly available is really good too. Uh, it's not just like, you know, um, for people who could pay for it. Uh, a lot of issues with new technology are about how, you know, only some people can access it. So increasing that accessibility is really, I think, a good move by OpenAI. Um, yeah. Hey, Pat, wondering, uh, Pete, wondering if you um, actually tried to use chat gpt at all if you had any thoughts on it i have not yet i plan to um yeah i I've, I've you know heard various people say it's great to so it's awful 
So I don't know. Um, but sometime over the holidays, I'll probably uh, um, have a chat to it and see see what happens. Sure. Yeah. One of the examples I saw online as well is somebody, a physician actually, asking the chat GPT to write a letter to a patient's insurance company for a approval for a drug. So prior okay. authorization. So it's kind of an interesting tool. <laughs> Yeah, Save the doctor, some time. Again, it's still pretty new, so I wouldn't use this in your day to day uh, work, yeah. obviously. Um, but the fact that this is here now and we're, we're you know, dealing yeah. with it is something to just consider because, yeah. yeah, definitely worth knowing about all that stuff. Definitely. So, the next article I have here is related to a discovery through an investigation. Mm -hmm. Many telehealth startups yeah. are actually sending sensitive information to big tech companies. So the markup did this and they found that out of the 50 telehealth websites that they tried out, 49 were sharing health data with big tech companies like you know Google, Amazon, Facebook. So that's a pretty significant amount. I did take a look at the list of, so here you can even see. Um, out of those 50 telehealth sites, 47 sites sent it to Google, 44 sites sent information to Facebook, 27 to Bing, TikTok, um, Snapchat, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and Twitter as well. Surprisingly, Twitter had the least amount shared, but, um, yeah, this is just another red flag being raised here that we need to be able to safeguard patients and consumers overall because i think there's still a lot of mm -hmm. misunderstanding about how their data is being used um they did also say that one company that did not share data was amazon clinic and they talked about how maybe that's because they're still so new so there wasn't really <laughs> um much data to share uh but and they also did close they're not really amazon clinic is not right available anymore um but yeah, you can see the list of all companies here. It's pretty did, staggering, isn't it? Um, it is, but I, I want to mention a caveat here because I think it's, I thought it was interesting that they didn't include some of the major telehealth companies like Doctors on Demand is not listed. Amwell mm -hmm. is not listed at all. Um, um, what else is there? Um, MD. What is the other telehealth company? There's a bunch of telehealth companies that are larger and they have more footprint actually in the United States, but they're not listed here. Okay. And they do specifically say that they tried to go after, not go after, but they um, were targeting uh, telehealth companies that were, were specifically marketing like, um, what is it? Uh, lifestyle drugs. So... Right. So that's what, um, like, you know, Roe, Hims and Hers. So, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of good detail in this article as well. It it does seem deceptive. Cerebral <laughs> Cerebral has been prescribing a lot of drugs for ADHD pretty liberally from what I understand. Right. So I think that's why this investigation targeted those companies instead of the larger companies that are more um, urgent care type of, um, you know, patients. Yeah. Actually, they do a lot more than urgent care, but they're not just targeting specific types of individuals. It's broadly used and many health systems use them. So it's different than the consumer facing only uh, telehealth applications. Um, I mentioned this because I have worked at Amwell before and they do, when I was there, they did a great job making sure that there weren't abusers of the program, um, meaning that they weren't people trying to game the system to uh, get prescription drugs, which is a really big deal in the telehealth industry. So especially, um, you know, with substance abuse disorders galore. So um, that's that. And I was thinking about ways blockchain or 
decentralized ledger technology can mitigate this. And I think the fact that, you know, patients here aren't owning their own data and the data is being owned and controlled basically by these companies and they're able to get away with HIPAA uh, laws because technically it mentions here how they're able to do this. Um, right. So they emphasize that privacy regulations like health and for health insurance, portability and accountability act HIPAA were not built for telehealth. Right. So there's a lot of ethical and moral gray areas that allow for the legal sharing of health related data. Um, this is from a former investigator of the U S department of health and human services office for civil rights. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Wondering what you guys think. Leave a comment in the notes in the YouTube. Okay, next here is an article from CoinDesk about Apple. And I thought this was an interesting opinion article about how Apple's new encryption policy is actually good for crypto. So it goes on to talk about here, um, you know, Apple made this announcement that their, their cloud iCloud storage service will now offer end-to-end -end encryption. Um, and this is something that I think a lot of users have been asking for for a long time. Uh, that means only a user with an authorized device will be able to access the contents of their cloud storage in much the same way only the holder of a private key can control a uh, Bitcoin wallet. So the new feature will protect photos, notes, and other files for users who choose to activate it. But it specifically says here, email, calendar, and contacts material are not included uh, because they need to interact with multiple services, which makes sense. Um, but this is def definitely in line with Apple's privacy leaning you know, policies. And I think it's interesting to just see how the crypto industry will react to this in the future as well. Um, here we have some tweets reporting from Reuters claim that the FBI had leaned on Apple not to enable this feature, which also makes a lot of sense. So you do have some government officials or at least government departments not really happy about this. So I think, you know, we'll be watching to see how that um, plays out in the end. I know Tim Cook well, not personally, but I know that Tim Cook um, thinks that privacy is very important and the U.S. government and Apple have always been in this sort of, uh, not battle, but, you know, conflict in terms of privacy and data sharing. Yeah, we'll see how that turns out. Um, I think it's personally a good thing for the industry and for humanity in general. So uh, it says here hundreds of thousands of users are about to be introduced to private key management by the most respected name in computing. So from there, crypto is just a hop and a skip away. So I think that's the takeaway here. All right. Next here is an article from Fierce Healthcare. Uh, it's about AWS and talks about their release or their launch of their new genomics data service for life sciences and healthcare companies. So Amazon's in genetics now. So this is a big deal, I think. Uh, and the fact that they're probably doing it for a lot cheaper than everybody else is probably a big deal as well. Um, so I'm curious to see how this plays out. Here it says more than 98% of medical records are now in digital form and the digitization, digitalization and sharing of medical data is driving the demand for precise or precision medicine technologies. Um, and it's obvious here that there's also been a steep decline in the cost of sequencing with a 100,000 fold reduction in cost since the human genome which was first sequenced in 2001, reaching an all-time low of approximately $200. That's amazing, just in general, as a technology. This is by far one of the most impressive things I think humans have done in the last 
um, 20 years or so. And I think we still haven't really felt the effects of this in the application of medicine yet. I mean, if you go to your doctor now, they're not going to typically give you a whole genome sequence test. Although it's relatively cheap, uh, it's just not part of the protocol now. But I think that is starting to slowly seep into the standards of care. Um, and that's an exciting thing because I think it's going to reveal a lot about our, our ourselves. Here it says AWS built Amazon Omics to support large scale analysis and collaborative research without healthcare companies needing to worry about provisioning the underlying infrastructure. Uh, customers can bring their own bioinformatics workflows and Amazon Omics manages the infrastructure to run it, according to AWS executives. So this further reduces undifferentiated heavy lifting, enables customers to operate in a secure environment with built-in access control, logging and audit trails while still complying with HIPAA, GDPR and other regulations. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how this will unfold. I don't think blockchain is used to at any part or any component of this stack, but um, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if there's any privacy gaps or security gaps that are identified in the future with this new service. I hope there isn't, but you know, with any centralized system, there's there's some risk there. Okay, so Coindesk article about MetaMask, which is one of the most popular browser uh, wallets, crypto wallets out there. So there was a claim out there that MetaMask is privacy and settings were really not that great in terms of data sharing practices. And there were concerns raised and then MetaMask responded um, here in a statement, the company explained how and why it was sharing MetaMask user internet protocol information, IP information, with Infura, which is the consensus made RPC, remote procedure call service, for reading and writing data to the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so a specifically, a change in wording to the consensus user agreement last month revealed that MetaMask by default, that's, that's uh, key here, shared users' transaction data with Infura alongside their IP addresses. Um, so like I said, this revelation sparked outrage in the vocal corner of the crypto community with some users worrying out loud about that their transaction data wasn't private as they assumed. So um, it's good to see that consensus and MetaMask are addressing this head on and um, what they said in the statement, consensus clarified that it would only collect wallet and IP address information in connection with write requests, also known as transactions, when MetaMask users broadcast transactions through Infura's RPC endpoints. They go on to say, we do not store wallet account address information when a MetaMask user makes a read request through Infura, for example, in order to check their account balances. So... Yeah, I mean, I think it's good to see that the voices of the crypto community were heard in this case, and it looks like MetaMask is working to address them. Um, I haven't dove too deep into this, so if there are some caveats, share them in the comments. I'm curious to know about that. One more quote here. We think this was overly cautious, and we are not intending to scare anyone away from choosing their chosen provider, the company adds. Um, yeah, so obviously it's still a developing space, but glad to see that there's some activity in the positive direction. All right, so next article, or actually this is sort of like an announcement and there was a hackathon event. Um, this up. Partija blockchain, which is a relatively newer blockchain, uh, teamed up with the Inter International Committee of the Red Cross and presented a prototype to support victims of armed conflict. So I thought this was interesting because 
what I had learned through watching some of the, the video here is that the International Committee of the Red Cross and the Red Cross, I believe, do not actually have to comply with many international laws related to um, privacy of data. Because they are such an emergency group, they don't have to, to comply with some of that, which was, I thought, kind of interesting. But they also said that they want to be able to comply with and they want to be able to provide privacy um, in a way that is still efficient and fast and effective. Um, building an, a platform that maintains privacy is a bit more complex, uh, but with blockchain, they are saying that it might be easier to do. And during the video, I actually learned that a lot of the ways that these organizations like the Red Cross and hu other humanitarian efforts, the way that they share and provide money to people in need is through cash, like paper money, because that's the simplest way to do it, uh, apparently. Um, and that makes sense. Like if you if you need to give people money who don't even have bank accounts in a war-ridden country, cash makes sense. The issue there is they can use it for anything. Um, so I think the purpose of this is to try to ensure that the money that the humanitarian tokens or you know, the Red Cross or other organizations go to, um, we want to make sure that it's being used not to, you know, fund terrorism, for example. So there's a lot of uh, concerns about that. So being able to put on a blockchain in a way that still protects the privacy, but also ensures that it doesn't end up in the hands of uh, nefarious actors, I think is an interesting thing. And, you know, this is a prototype still. They're using Artesia. So check it out if you're interested. Um, this event happened just uh, last week. So pretty cool. All right. That's all I had for news and articles. Um, I'm sure there's much more to share, but this is what I pulled up. In terms of educational nuggets, uh, there was one lengthy blog from v of a town Buterich talking about what he's excited about in the sector, in the industry as well as an interesting breakdown of decentralization and specifically how, you know, he differentiated between the decentralization for governance sake and decentralization for implementation sake. And I think something that we're all sort of interested in learning about is what is decentralization? So part of that learning includes understanding the nuances and, and um, different concepts behind decentraliz decentralization. So, um, really great article. I'm not going to dive too deep into it right now, uh, but he talks about, you know, ENS, POAPs, um, proof of humanity, things like that. Um, this section, section four, I thought was most interesting talking about, you know, the distinction of decentralization for robustness and, um, for efficiency. So if you want to dive deep into decentralization, definitely read this article. Um, again, decentraliz decentralization for interoperability. So, and how that breaks down into either governance structure or implementation. So, yeah, um, definitely a, a good article here. So check this out if you're interested. And finally, um, I published on my Health Unchained podcast my 107th episode with the leaders of Pharma Ledger Association. So I'm not going to get into too much detail, but Pharma Ledger is a consortium in Europe trying to devise ways to use blockchain to help improve the healthcare ecosystem overall and, and, and increase trust as well. Um, and with their their main use case now is the electronic product information app and tool. So if you're interested, check that out. Great conversation. Both Dan and Marco are amazing, and they've been really leading that space, um, among many others as well in Pharma Ledger, to kind of help explain, help experiment with, with DLT for healthcare. So really, really proud of that team. Uh, that's what I had on the agenda today. So quite short, I hope you all have a happy winter solstice day. 
and good holiday as well. Uh, Pete, thanks for joining. Do you have any comments on the the content here? Anything you wanted to share? Anything you found recently? Um, I thought it was great. There are probably at least three or probably four things on your on your list there that you sort of highlighted that are things that uh, either I'd heard of and and not read yet, but or are completely new to me. And I need to read. So uh, this has been a thoroughly useful thirty-eight minutes. Awesome, thank um, you. And did you have you really done one hundred and seven podcasts? Yeah, one hundred and seven. I've been doing mm. it for years now. Yeah. So yeah. wow. Congrats. Yeah, to be honest, when I first started, I didn't think there'd be that many people doing healthcare with blockchain, but uh, thankfully. There's a lot more, actually. I could probably do like 500 if I really, really had the. All right. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And leave a comment, like, subscribe. Appreciate it. Thank you. See ya. You take care.